These are the times of broader highways but narrower viewpoints. These are the times where man has gone all the way to the moon and has come back. But he finds it difficult to cross the road and meet the new neighbor. These are the times where man has broken the atom and he has produced tremendous amount of energy. But he finds it difficult to break a prejudice. The list is very long describing the state of affairs of the 21st century man and society, but in short you can say that these are the times where we have much to show in the show window and nothing in the stockroom. We live in this century and as the theme of your conference, we are into the fourth industrial revolution. I myself, I am an engineer. I finished my engineering way back in 1991. I could see from the faces of many that when you were just in your shorts and as toddlers, I finished my engineering. And then after I took my diksha, I'm a saint since 26 years, so I know both the parts of the world and both the parts of life. I come from one of the largest organizations in the world, the BAPS Swaminarayan Sanstha. How many of you have been to Akshardham at Delhi or Akshardham at Gandhinagar? Almost all of you. I come from that organization. Such small and big, we have 1,300 campuses in 60 countries of the world. We have a permanent seat in the United Nations as an NGO. We do 162 different kinds of social, cultural, educational, medical, environmental activities across the globe. And when I want to talk something to you today about rethinking your goals, I've personally met and sat at least for half an hour with more than 25,000 families go visiting their homes in more than 20 countries and 100 cities all around the world. So let us talk something about goals as a smart professional and goals as a great human being. We all sitting here, I think all of us are very clear in our minds that we all want to be smart professionals and great human beings. This combination, isn't it? Give me a yes or no. You want to live a good business life, you want to live a good personal life, you want to live a good social life, you want to live a good family life. Yes or no? So we need to rethink our goals, redesign our goals and rebuild our lives not just for the betterment of our own kind, but for the betterment of the society at large. From my experience of personally meeting and sitting at least for half an hour with more than 25,000 families across caste, creed, color, religion, nationality backgrounds, let me share with you something. First important aspect, that everybody needs to accept and really accept from within is that no man is perfect and that no man includes me and I also. Put your eye to a little lower level and you will be in a position to accept the best of thoughts from all directions to rethink your goals. Bill Gates, perhaps the second richest person upon this earth, he has written his book, his autobiography, Business at the Speed of Light. How many of you have read it? Just two or three of you. You need to read it. It's as good as attending this conference. He writes in this book, how an high school dropout, he himself, Bill Gates, he becomes the richest person upon this earth and a self-made richest person. He writes that the secret of my success is the culmination of three things. 
First, determination. Second, intense hard work. And third, acceptance of the ideas of others. You have to keep your mind open. You have to keep your ears open. You have to keep your eyes open. To accept good ideas from surroundings that can constantly and really constantly keep on shaping up your goals for the betterment of yourself, for the society and humanity at large. Acceptance of the ideas of others is a big aspect. Second important aspect to rethink your goals is the biggest worry of the society today and rather the biggest disease of the 21st century man is that we have given too much power to money than it actually deserves. We all sitting here, we have given too much power to money that it decides our relationships, it decides our status, it decides everything in our life. Lesser the love for money, more clarity of goal will be in your minds. First tell yourself that definitely I will earn big money, definitely I will use for a better purpose, but I will not have over attachment towards it because it is the root cause of all miseries in life. From physical ailments to mental disorders to emotional instabilities. The principal cause is over love for money. It is not helping you in any way, at least to redesign your goal of life. Just sit back at home today evening and make two lists. List number one, things that money can buy and make you happy. And list number two, things that money cannot buy and you still need it to be happy. Raise your hands if you can give me an answer. Things that money can buy to make you happy. I started a luxurious car. Now give me answers, a couple of you. A house. Just raise your hands if you want to. Things that money can buy to make you happy. Family? Traveling, okay. Nobody else from that corner. Comfort? Kya jada socha nahi rakha iske baare mein? Raat din uske piche to dorde ho. Things that money cannot buy to make you happy. I started happiness. Just raise your hands. Peace, love, health. Sorry? Good time with loved ones. I tell you with confidence and my experience of 26 years of speaking at national international seminars and meeting n number of national international personalities and reading more than 500 autobiographies and biographies in my life. Let me tell you, if there are hundred things that money can buy and make you happy, there are thousand things that money cannot buy and you still need it to be happy. So don't overemphasize the factor called money in your life. That overlaw for it, that power given, to, given by you to it is not allowing you to redesign the actual and real goals of life. Money can buy you the best houses it does not have the power to convert into a home. Money can buy you branded clothes and jewelry it does not have the power to give you beauty and handsomeness. If money can buy you the best of health care it does not have the power to give you good health. Otherwise, otherwise, why would Aditya Birla, the chairman of the Aditya Birla group, pass away because of cancer at the age of 51? Money can buy you a good health care, not health. Money can buy you good food every day. It does not have the power to give you digestion. Money can buy you good beds. 
Michael Jackson was sleeping on a bed of 94,000 USD. And still after taking 10 sleeping pills, he could not sleep for two hours. So money can buy you good beds. It cannot buy you sleep. So again, I put forward emphatically the statement that if money can buy you 100 things to make you happy, it does not have the power to buy you other 1,000 things which actually make you more happier. Decrease the power and influence of money on you and your life. Only then you will live a perfect human life. Again, I repeat, it is needed. Earn it well, so that you can help the society well. But don't have over love and infatuation for it. Otherwise, it will so much overpower your mind. It will consume so much of your time that you won't be able to think of any other aspects of life which are very beautiful. Remember, this is a 70 or 80 year game. Human life is 70 or 80 years game. Yes or no? Many of you sitting half gone. Many of you sitting three-fourth gone. And I give you one calculation that will open your eye with a jerk. Eight hours of the day you sleep. Yes or no? On an average, it will come to eight hours. When you were a child, you were sleeping 10, 12 hours. When you'll be old, you'll be sleeping 10, 12 hours. So average will come down to eight hours a day. One third of the day you are sleeping, isn't it? Out of 24 hours, eight hours. So one third of the day you sleep. Straight equation, directly proportional. One third of the life you will sleep. So of the 70 years that you live upon this earth, your 23 years are going to be in sleep. You don't know whether you exist or not. Startling, isn't it? So, need to give a proper thinking to life. Money, power, status, fame. I don't say that you don't go for it. I only say, reduce the power of influence of it on your life and you personally. Because all this combined doesn't give you the richness of human life that actually you are here to discover. I'm not just talking spiritual. I can give you n number of examples and incidents from your professional field, from your corporate field, from times immemorial. Napoleon Bonaparte who was the emperor of France and only one of the seven people whose name Napoleon Bonaparte, after his name, it's written the great. Napoleon Bonaparte the Great. People in England used to shiver by his name. 90% of Europe was under him. And he writes in his autobiography that I can have the world at my feet. I can buy any luxuries under this sun and upon this earth. But I haven't seen six happy days in my life. Now what is that? You need to think. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, the greatest entertainer upon this earth ever. When he was just 21, there were 78 Elvis endorsed products in the market. His cavalcade was seven limousines, and each limousine was painted with crushed diamonds on it. So seven limousines in the cavalcade, and crushed diamonds stuck on it, shining cars. He was the first entertainer to travel by private jets. Two 737 Boeings. One is private and second is staff and system. When he used to do his famous swivel and throw his leather jacket in the audience, within minutes it would be into pieces. People would take an Elvis souvenir back home. During his lifetime when he was just 32, he had self earned $1,000 million. During his lifetime, 500 million records were sold of his. Now listen. One day when he was playing his famous composition, How Great Dawat, 
and his secretary, she just stepped in and asked him, so how are you feeling at the peak of your career? He dropped his hand from the piano, he dropped his head down and said, very alone. Every evening you are getting an audience of 1,000 plus. Every morning when you wake up and come in the gathering, you have 200 people to come to see you. And you say you are feeling very alone. And yes, it was true. On 16th August 1977, at the age of 33, Elvis Presley took 40 sleeping pills and at night and never woke up. He committed suicide. At the age of 33, why with everything that all of us crave for, he had to commit suicide? Not such one example. Why did Dharam Hinduja, the scion of the Hinduja family at the age of 22, commit suicide? Did he have one Mercedes less? Was he asked not to have one more travel plan? You have to rethink, to redesign your life, rebuild your life. Money, fame, status is not everything in life. Again, I say, you definitely go for it because it's a human endeavor, it's a human dignity. But keep a physical, mental bar, keep a time bar somewhere, keep a satisfaction bar somewhere so that other good thoughts from all directions enter your mind to make a fascinating, enriching human life. The most important need for the 21st century is to reinvent himself, of the 21st century man. To reinvent himself is the most important need. This is the second aspect to be understood before we start rethinking our goals. Recently a book is published and the title of the book is what they don't teach you at Harvard. I'll give you the gist of it. The book contains that for the full development of yourself and to be very clear in your aims and goals in life, you need the complete development of three H in your life. First H is your hand. But when only the hand works, it is labor. Second edge is your head. When the hand and the head, they work together, it becomes skill. And the third edge is your heart. When the hand, head and the heart, all three work together, it becomes art. Make every act of your life an art. Put your heart fully into it. This is the essence. And here is the start of redefining the goals of human life. Again, the base statement that I put forward at the start of the talk. You need to be a smart professional and a great human being combined. That gives you a balanced, satisfied life. Ratan Tata, he was at a convocation day of a B school just about a couple of years back and he told the fresh management graduates after all his experience in the corporate world of more than 60 years he said that don't count your successes and don't count your luxuries by the amount of money that you have in your bank account by the number of properties that you have accumulated by the number of relationships that you have in your life, by your social networking skills. This is all not your wealth. He said, count your successes and luxuries of life by the number of lives that you have enriched of people with you during the course of your journey of life. How many your lives you have enriched by yourself. This is the start of the real thinking, of the meaning, of the topic that is rethinking your goals. You worked in the corporate world for 35, 40 years. You had a fat bank balance. 
you had good properties, good family, good social relationships, everything fine. All credits to you for your good earnings in all aspects of life. But how many lives did you enrich? How many lives did you better of people around you? That is the aim of human living. I've come to you today as I'm given this topic to share something. I don't charge anything for my talks. I've been talking since 26 years at national international seminars. I don't charge a single peso for my talks. Am I right? The organizer somewhere. This is my selfless social service, giving and caring for the society. And it gives me immense pleasure. It gives me immense pleasure to share and care for the society. So rethinking goals, first important positive aspect is ask yourself every day in the evening, at the end of your day, did I do something to enrich a life of someone around me? From a small smile to a big health, did you enrich something? Did you enrich a life? Did you enrich an environment? Otherwise, apne liye to pashu bhi jeevan jeete for their own self-interest, even the animals they live upon this earth. If you live only for your growth, for your betterment, for your luxuries, entertainment in life, it is nothing more than a dog life, donkey life and cat life. It is not a human life. If we all here are destined, and we are, and we are fortunate, we are specially blessed, all of us sitting, that we have things, many things, much more extra than an ordinary human being. Isn't it? In all ways of life. Then when you have that, you must spare some part of it, of your resources and time for the betterment of people, enriching people and environment around you. In terms of values, in terms of services, in terms of health, in terms of growth. Because when I talk to corporates and professionals, I tell them that the amount of money that you have in your bank account when you die is the extra work you did, you shouldn't have done. You should have spent that time doing some good activity for the upliftment of society. This is the first aspect. Again, the big disease of the 21st century is that we give overemphasis to mind and lesser emphasis to heart. We talk of IQs. Now it is an old dated talk. In the 90s, it was talked about the IQs. At the turn of the millennium, they started a new quotient and that is called the emotional quotient. From IQ, it shifted to EQ, paradigm shift, emotional quotient. Your IQ is, you think rationally, you talk purposefully, you act meaningfully, and you deal very effectively with the situation. That is your IQ. They say good IQs make good team heads. You can lead a good team. More than IQ is your EQ, emotional quotient. It's all about having empathy for others. Where you know and you consider before taking a decision your own emotions and the emotions of the person before you jump to a conclusion. It is like knowing the whole picture before you jump to a conclusion. That is called your emotional quotient. And they say, the top management gurus, you read them, Jim Collins, Stephen Covey, Anthony Robbins, Ken Blanchard, Robin Smith, they all have come to recognize, accept, and propagate that those with higher EQs, they become leaders, not just team heads. Because when you learn to deal with people more than machines, when you keep on having increased trusts in people more than machines, 
Not only you grow, people grow. The environment enriches around you. So those with IQ, they become team heads. Those with IQ plus EQ, they become leaders. And now, in the last decade, they have come to know that there is a very big important quotient and that is called the spiritual quotient. A very good book I would suggest for all you professionals. I've read it three times. It's from the bottom of my heart for you today. If you have a piece of paper and pen, you can definitely write it down. The title of the book is Spiritual Intelligence. Why it matters more than IQ and EQ. The actual, actual title is Spiritual Intelligence, the Ultimate Intelligence. Co-authored by Dr. Ian Marshall and Dr. Dana Zohar. In this book, they have surveyed more than about 3,000 successful people upon this earth. Successful not just in business. Successful as a businessman, as a father, as a husband, or as a wife, as a mother, as a brother, as a sister, as a neighbor, as a relative, as a friend. Successful in all walks of life, in all roles that a human being normally plays in his life. Long interviews with them. They are past, present, studied well. And they have listed out that a person who has spiritual intelligence, how he stands out from people who have just IQs high or even IQs plus EQs high, listed out eight important aspects. I don't go into the details of it. I'll just list you out. People with high SQ or if you want to develop a good SQ, the other way around, you need to work upon these eight areas. The first is flexibility to change. The new Harvard definition of intelligence is the new Harvard definition of intelligence is the more quicker you can adapt yourself to a change, you are intelligent. Many of us we have mathematical intelligence, we are good at numbers, engineering softwares. Many of them, we have concrete intelligence, we can deal with machines well. Many of us have social intelligence, we can interact with people well. But the best intelligence is flexibility to change. He survives. Second, spiritual intelligence aspect is self-awareness. What am I? Where am I? What I'm supposed to do? What I'm talking? What I'm looking at? What I need to talk? Who are the people around me? Absolute self-aware person. He never makes a private or a public mistake. That is spiritual intelligence. Third, an ability to face and use suffering of life. Any suffering in your life, personal life, professional life, social or family life, that is part and parcel of life, isn't it? Because life is a package deal. As you give packages to your employees, life is a package deal from God. As your employees, they like 70% of your package deal and 30% is a compulsion. <clears throat> Even for you people. Your higher-ups giving you a good deal, 70% you like it and 30% is a compulsion. You don't like it, still you are supposed and forced to do it if you want to enjoy that 70%. In the same way, life is a packet deal. It, is, it has its pluses and minuses. So, if you have or you develop a capacity to face your suffering with a smiling face and then use your suffering for your elevation. Now, this is something very important that I'm telling you. You should develop a neck. Some people have that neck to use their suffering for their own elevation. The top guy in the country, the top gentleman in the country has this neck. Anything thrown at him, he can use it and convert it into a giant vote bank. That is a neck. Anything thrown at him, he can convert it into a 
in your corporate language a big business and his language a big vote bank that is a neck an ability to face and use suffering fourth an ability to be inspired by vision you see something actually we always see we don't observe much here the word see is observe you see something and you are inspired by it the fifth aspect of spiritual intelligence is to see connection between diverse things diagonally opposite happenings and you see a connection between them that is very crucial to you solving problems at your workplace the sixth aspect of spiritual intelligence is an ability to cause as little harm as possible to people and surroundings how can i be more helpful the seventh aspect is to ask and probe fundamental questions why when what why how before you give in and the last and the eighth aspect of spiritual intelligence is an ability to think and work against a convention so these are the eight aspects of spiritual intelligence and rethinking your goals is to give more thinking and emphasis to this eight aspects of life you develop your sq beyond your iq and eq for a great human life so when you are deciding the goals of your life take your iq into consideration take your eq into consideration and take your sq into consideration intelligent quotient emotional quotient and spiritual quotient now this is taught by the top class management gurus top class social relationship gurus and top class health gurus upon this earth for this teaching they charge you 500 dollars a day you are getting foc now rethinking your goals in the intelligence se sector let me pin you a bit you all will get a chance you already got a chance many times and you will get in future for a short cut cut to rise for an unethical path to rise if you go for it you will have easy and quick buck at the end of the day but one day you can be a big loser never ever adopt unethical practices to grow this is the most urgent need for a working man today in the world you remain wedded to ethical principles at your workplace in your personal life the growth may initially you may find it slow but it would be concrete with deep foundation nobody with unethical practices if at all he has grown he has stayed there okay because i am emphatically put forward a statement when talking to the corporate world i tell them that your intelligence your academics your talents your experience your backgrounds your platforms your support systems can open any gate for you but only your character can keep that gate open you lose out on that and you are anybody whoever you are whatever you are wherever you are you can become zero from hero within seconds even if the name of your company is satya and you go for a satya practices a guy of 8000 crores seven years rigorous imprisonment even if you are the king of the skies and you go for an ethical practices you have to live in india without an indian passport the guy is being brought back already ordered by the uk court when he comes and opens his mouth he will put many people in trouble things will come times will come even if you are the sahara of thousands of families you can still live be sahara in tihar for four years
Don't go for unethical practices. Even if you are a spearhead pace attack of India, Indian cricket team, if you go for spot fixing, you can't avoid a life ban on yourself. You are getting me right? Yes or no? So don't tell yourself 20 years of corporate experience, CEO of a 500 crore company, I am untouchable. Never think that, okay? Never tell yourself holding your handset in your hand and oh, 500 big contacts, 15 ministers, 10 MLAs, 20 MPs, 50 corporate honkos. Nothing can happen to me. I can call at midnight anybody and these people are at my help. Situations will come in your life when you go for unethical practices and caught. None of this less your phone will go through. It can land you in jail. So remain wedded to ethical practices. Rethink your goals. Don't tell yourself, Koi bhi paristiti mein, Anyhow, any way, I want to be a 100 crore company. Not anyhow, any way, okay? That words keep your, your, for yourself, for, your, for generating energy from you. Anyhow, any way, I will do it. That is for your self-inspiration and motivation, not for your behaviors. Got it? Otherwise, you can be in trouble. So even if the best IQ, whatever intelligence you possess, in short, even if you are the chairman of the Madhya Pradesh Electric City Board, because we are sitting here in Indore, even if you are the chairman or even if you are the power minister, I can tell you one line on a fine Sunday morning when you are cup, sitting with a cup of tea and reading your Sunday newspaper, you can't look at the electric plug, raise your shoulder, raise your, you know, callers, raise it and tell it, okay, I am the electric city board chairman, your distribution is in my hands and this is my finger I am putting in the plug, okay, take care of it. Being in the electrical distribution field for 35 years and being the chairman of the electric company, you don't have your right to put your finger inside the plug. What happens even if you are the chairman? Chipka degi, marjaoge. Because electric city doesn't know your power your position, your status, your wealth, nothing. It, it knows only human flesh and blood. In the same way, unethical practices done by you doesn't know your power, your position, your status, your wealth. Unethical practices is like electricity. Don't play with it. This is your, I'm talking of Behaviors at your workplace. Now, let me tell you of the latest burning issue, ethical behavior in your personal life. The Me Too movement. Very less speakers would talk on this. The day it came out, I decided to talk in public as well. I've been talking since last about six months on this. Remain very ethically wedded to your personal character as well. This is more powerful than unethical practices at workplace. It can ruin you. It can ruin your career. It can ruin your family. All your goals thought in your teenage, young age, and the start of your professional career will go all in vain within seconds. Because the earth is round, it doesn't have any corner, so it doesn't have any place to keep your wrongs. We all study science, isn't it? In our high school, I think in physics, we had a force called the Buon force. When a hard solid object you try to put inside a bucket filled with water, the water gushes it up and it is called the Buon force, but it pushes it up, isn't it? All your wrongs possess a tremendous Buon force. It has the power to come up in the open and shout, yes, this guy did this. Even a central government minister had to put in his papers because of the Me Too movement. From there, 
to a giant e-platform CEO in Bangalore. They have to put in their papers because of this. And thereafter I say that today it is the Me Too movement. This generation of ours will see a C2 movement. You know what is this C2 movement? Now we are standing into India 4.0. Am I right? The theme of the conference? The new industrial revolution. You are talking of nanotechnology. You are talking of artificial intelligence. These people will design softwares. Because in future all the cities will come under CCTV every square inch. Today London is the only city in the world that every square inch of its public space is under CCTV. It will happen to all the cities in future, in the near future. If somebody complains that this guy or this person looked at me in my, like it was like not comfortable to me and it is caught on CCTV, then it's difficult to prove that, okay, I just looked at it. It was not, nothing malignant in it. But then this AI people, nanotechnology people, IT people will develop 20, 25 types of softwares that if they are put on your vision in the iPhone, it will prove that that was something wrong in it. <laughs> this is the next step of AI that your conference is on. I was sent the email by the organizers where I read it. I just read the mail, rethink, redesign, and rebuild. And there we are in today, revolution, industrial revolution, technological revolution 4.0. This nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, everything is revolutionizing the world. This will reach to that level where your blood will be made in the laboratories. This generation will see that our blood will be made in the laboratories. This generation will see that softwares can prove everything. This generation of ours will see, I'm giving you bigger visions. Our generation today we sitting will see that if there is a murder somewhere, even after one hour of, or one day after that, they'll be able to click pictures going there, figures will be there and they can produce a positive picture that you see today that yes, this is a lie that you killed. Pictures will be clicked of people after they have left the venue. One hour after that, one day after that. This will all come into practice. To stand yourself firm in the midst of this revolution. Definitely you adhere to the revolution. That is the need of the times. But at the same time, take more care of your thoughts, your behaviors, your ethical values in life. Only then you will be able to withstand this new revolution. Only then you will be able to flow with the tide of the new revolution. Only then you will be able to manage yourself. Otherwise you will be a loser. This is much needed. Today in this 21st century. This is the need of the hour. So this is India 4.0. Added value to it is what I'm talking to you. Added enhancement to it, this is what I'm talking to you. If you decide to grow, basically there is a misconception among us. You increase the turnover of your company and people also tell you, you also start feeling that I have started becoming successful. Isn't it? Yes or no? No. There is a big difference between growth, progress, and success. If you increase the turnover of your company from 50 crores to 100, from 100 to 500 crores, it is called growth. It is not success. Let me redefine you the definition of success. Increasing your materialistic possessions in all ways is your growth. That growth, if it is aided by ethics, ethic means discipline, means honesty, means norms, it is called progress. So growth plus ethics is progress. And that progress plus humanity, morality, 
and spirituality is called success. So again I tell you, your turnover increase from 100 to 500 crores, you are not successful, you have just grown. Added by ethics, you have progressed. Added by moralities and spirituality in life, it's called success. Because even after having 100 million dollars in your bank account and you, you are not happy from within, you have just grown, you have not been successful. Successful word itself includes stability, happiness and peace along with all types of your growth and progress. Now rethink your goals. You just want to grow or be progressive or want to be successful. So now, according to this definition, just raise your hands. How many of you want to be successful? That's fine, all of you. Be clear in your thinking. There is this difference between growth, progress, and success. Be very clear about it. Only, thing, only then you will be able to rethink your goals and redesign your path to rebuild yourself. Let me talk to you about a person whom I have seen so closely for 30 years, observed every act of his life, very closely saw every deed of his life. Pramukh Swami Maharaj, the creator of Akshardham, which you have all been to. In his life, during his lifetime, the intense hard work that he did selflessly for the upliftment of people in all walks of life. He traveled to 18,000 villages in 60 countries of the world selflessly to uplift people, to de-addict them, to culture them, to tell them that you, can, you must send your kids to school, into deep Adivasi, SCST areas of the country and elsewhere. People used to write him for their personal family issues. Such more than 7.5 lakh letters he read and answered in his lifetime at an unbelievable average of reading and answering more than 70 letters a day without a Sunday for 45 years. Not just blessings, a clear cut, do this or not. If you go back Monday morning to your office, anywhere where you come from, from all over the country, and you find, you open your mailbox and you find like about 15 mails, 20 mails to answer before lunchtime, what would you feel? My goodness, first half gone. Pramukh Swami Maharaj answered seven zero letters a day without a Sunday for 45 years. He met more than 500 people a day, personal audience to them, listening to their issues and guiding them well. He has been to Akshardham, such 1300 campuses he single-handedly built and administered in 60 countries of the world. You all sitting here, you are handling one house, one family, one office, that is a manufacturing unit, one manufacturing unit, maybe a trustee or a patron somewhere in a couple of institutes, and by the end of the day, by the evening, you go mad. Isn't it? He single-handedly erected and administered well more than 100 hospitals, schools, hostels, and colleges. You go on number eight national highway from Abu to Mumbai, every 50 kilometers you will find our institute. He personally visited more than 3.5 lakh homes, offices, shops, and factories. Imagine, and I tell you, when it comes to NGO working, Corporate working is easier than NGO working if you are going in an NGO to this class. Because in your corporate world, the system of working and relationship is pay and smile. Your pay is liked by your employee and so there is a smile on his face and your employee's work, you like it, so there is a smile on your face. So you are paying him in money, he is paying you in work. So it is called the Pay and smile relationship. What we in NGO, when we are full time, 
in an NGO, the relationship and the working model is serve and smile relationship. You have to serve and smile. For 26 years, for example, I'm doing this. I don't have a bank account. I don't touch money. I don't keep money. I don't wear ornaments. I only two pieces of cloths. And this footwear I'm wearing is just since the third in 26 years. But can you see a little lesser ounce of happiness on my face than yours? Serve and smile relationship. You enjoy much better. But when you are guiding a huge institute of the class of the BAPS organization that I come from, where you have to take care of people's emotions, of their wishes, of their likings. In your corporate world, you have to take care of this, but on a very little lesser way. If you don't like, you can hire and fire. Here it is not that. So guiding a huge NGO is more difficult than guiding a huge corporate. There Pramukh Sami Maharaj was extremely successful. He initiated more than 1,100 saints like me. How many of you have five people in your office? Let me ask you a very blank question on your face. How many of you sitting here have at least five people in your office who have been working with you since more than 20 years? Not more than 10 hands raised. So here comes the importance of serve and smile relationship. Of the 1,100 saints that we are in the organization, more than 750 of them are graduates, postgraduates, chartered accountants, doctors, and engineers. Out of them, more than 150 of them are born American and British citizens. Out of them, more than about 50 of our saints are graduates, postgraduates from Carnegie Mellon, Yale, Kilong, Harvard, Oxford, Stanford. Many of our saints have left aside $100,000, $200,000 of job. So Pramukh Swami Maharaj was successful in initiating young cultured mind into mainstream social service, mainstream spirituality. There's a huge success. He worked with all his intelligence. He worked all with his emotions. He worked all with his spiritual, spirituality in life. How? I tell you. Once he was asked, which thought remains with you 24-7? in your mind constantly. And he said, the thought that has never entered my mind, shall I tell it first? And that was more interesting. Pramukh Swami Maharaj said, the thought of hurting anybody physically, mentally, or emotionally has never entered my mind. This is your richness from within. नहीं ये ऑफिस में नया आया है शायद वो बॉस से बहुत नजदीक जा रहा है इसको गिराना तो पड़ेगा शायद आप गिरा दोगे लेकिन आप भी एक दिन गिर जाओगे द सिस्टम इज राउंड एंड इट कम्स बैक छोटे थे तब फ्रिज भी खेलते थे ना यू थ्रो द फ्रिज भी इन द एयर एंड इट कम्स बैक इन द सेम रूट द लॉ ऑफ कर्म अप्लाइज लिव विद दिस पैशन let me grow, let everybody grow. This is rethinking your goals. Let me enrich myself. Let my surrounding and people enrich themselves. Let me be wealthy, let him be wealthy. Let me work, let him work. Let me grow, let him grow. Let me be prosperous, let he be prosperous. Let me be happy, let he be happy. If you are driving a Hyundai of 25 lakhs and he's a driving a mark of two, car two crores, don't envy. It is his destiny. It is his hard work. It is his luck. You are driving your luck, your destiny, your hard work. Simple. Remain satisfied. This should be your goal in life. Otherwise, your 25 lakh Hyundai car's joy will vanish within one week if you see a mark parked beside you. And especially of your brother-in-laws. <laughs> Rethinking your goals is this. Materialistic possessions are not everything in life. Life is much beyond that. If you haven't read good 200 books in your life, you will never grow as a human being. But you don't want to read it because you feel that everything is on the screen, on my mobile, on my iPad. I'm not against it. I also use a mobile, I use, an, I I use a laptop, I, I have an iPad, I have a full-time office. You need to get to the people, you need to get to work. But 
don't become a slave of it today in this india 4.0 when you have your theme rethink redesign rebuild let me tell you be tax savvy but don't be tax slavey you got this be tax savvy i'm also tax savvy to make your work better but don't be tax slavey don't open your mobiles and keep it on till 11 pm and 12 midnight which you normally do tell me a good yes or no you do it why because i think you owe all the responsibilities of your profession isn't it do you think that you know too much about 2g 3g 4g calls came call the call scam and everything that some day at 11:30 pm you may get a call from the pmo to make you a member of the joint parliamentary committee and you don't accept that phone because you have gone to sleep and then it's a big <laughs> non service to the country are you expecting a call from narendra modi at 11:30 pm so you are keeping your phone on this gadgets are made to serve you the reverse has happened we have become the slaves of this gadgets for no reason consciously or unconsciously every third minute your hand touches the mobile if it doesn't touch you become discharged <laughs> knowingly or unknowingly you have to touch something and every third minute you get your mobile out from your pocket is there something is there then are you a celebrity <laughs> that every third minute you have to check your social media your instagram how many followers your fb somebody asked me swami are you are you on facebook i said no i face the book <laughs> you need to give a good thinking to life otherwise your life will end 80 years will go and at the end of your life you will feel my god gone read a good book i again give you a good book to read the title of the book is the five regrets of the dying written by an australian nurse her name bronnie ware this book remained the best seller in the new york times list for 64 weeks in itself it's a world record she was a nurse taking care of critically ill patients and secretly because the patients knew that they were going to die in another 2 3 to 5 weeks the family members knew the paramedical staff taking care of the patient knew so it was obvious but this nurse when she and the patient were alone in the room she would ask the patient to fill up this form that sir or the lady that when you are leaving this world when you know that in the next 2 5 weeks you will leave this world what do you cherish and what do you regret from an ordinary carpenter to a ceo to a family business owner whole range of people have responded she started a blog that became famous she was advised to write a book she wrote a book which became famous the book made her a millionaire the title of the book is five regrets of the dying in which she writes that all this more than 1000 range of people who responded to me they had this five regrets in common at the end of their life again i repeat from an ordinary carpenter to a ceo to a family business owner the first regret they had why upon earth did i work so much like a donkey the first regret and you all say no i want to put 10 hours of work 12 hours of work 14 hours of, until i become a 100 crore company i will put 15 hours a day foolishness you have not understood life you don't know what is the goal of life mukesh ambani is not drinking curry in the evening made up of liquid gold okay you got it he is also drinking curry made up of buttermilk that you and me eat and what you will eat in the evening dinner he is not chewing uh, gold biscuits okay glucose like you and me as simple as that and the amount of joy 
that he is getting watching a rising sun is not more than you. The amount of joy that he is getting seeing the tide and the ebb of the sea is not more than you when you get it watching it. The natural resources of happiness are same for everybody. Man-made happiness sources can differ, but they don't long, last life long. Rethinking your goals is being more dependent upon natural happiness that is within you than artificial happiness. This is the need of the hour. I'm not against technology. I'm just into the last minutes of my talk for the organizer. I'm not against technology. Everything must grow from nanotechnology to AI. But we need to put a line of demarcation somewhere. More of technology, at the same time, it has one cruel thing that it carries with it, more of crime. When Werner von Braun, he invented the rockets that could send satellites into space. At the end of his life, he writes in his autobiography, I'm putting him in not just word to word, but letter to letter. He writes that for only with God reinstated in the hearts and minds of people that he would advise us, he would inspire us to work more on the technical, technological sides and much more on the ethical sides to save us from the dangers of technological revolution. I'm not against artificial intelligence, but we will have to put a bar somewhere. Otherwise, it will snatch away many level three, level four jobs. And this level three, level four job people, they don't have alternates to earn. They have only one skill or one type of thinking or they know only one work sphere. And when that job is taken away by artificial intelligence, he will have no option but to commit a crime to fill his stomach and the stomach of his family members. Again, I repeat, I'm not against it, but we'll have to put a bar somewhere. Technology should be helpful in your growth, progress, and success. It should absolutely mind in taking away the jobs of small people. More jobs gone of small people and you will invite more problems in society. More kidnappings, more murders, more shootouts, more terrorism. So you will have to put a bar of demarcation, a bar of discrimination, a line of control. To what extent we can go in this fear? If machines will start doing everything, what will you and me do from the morning? And from early childhood, we have heard and learned a proverb, an idle mind, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. So your and my mind will be devil's workshop after full development of AI. Then what will we do? Commit crimes. No other, no other business. So this is also a small but a very important aspect that we must consider, which is very much necessary, rather absolutely. Coming towards the end of my talk, when you decide the goal of your life, many of us have decided, but rethinking to it, being a smart professional and a great human being, that is the combination. Keep faith in God. Keep faith in His doership. To work, when you go to work, tell yourself that nobody is going to help me. I have to work my way. And at the end of the work, don't think much about success or failures. Give it to God, let him give me the result. My job was to put my all resources that I have into my project. Rest, he decides, I accept it. That will give you a wonderful, peaceful life. Because if there are 10 factors affecting the success of your project which are in your hands, there are 100 factors that affect the failure of your project which are not in your hands. Here is where Lord Krishna tells Arjun in Srimad, Bhagavad Gita, Karmanye Vadhikaraste Ma Faleshu Kadachana. Krishna tells, today top corporate Hong Kongs are you are trying to accept this. What did Krishna tell? He tells Arjun, now remember or listen very carefully. 
Arjun, your job is to perform your duty well. Put all your resources to bring success to you. But final result, I will decide. Whether to give you, not to give you, how much to give you. This is very clear. I can prove this to you practically today, right in front of you, logically. I can get a yes from you when I ask you. All of you have an experience. All of us have an experience. That sometimes we planned very well. We executed very well. And yet we did not reach the peak of success that we wanted. Lesser success or sometimes we failed. Yes or no? The other way, again a yes from you. Sometimes you planned less. It was all in a hurry. You were not satisfied by the execution of it. And yet you got results beyond your imagination. Yes or no? Tell me a big yes. It has to be yes. That means sometimes it's the best of planning, you got lesser things. Sometimes it's the worst of it, you got more things. That means some factors invisible to you are getting applied on it which are beyond your control to bring successes to you. That is decided by God. So I am of the opinion, and you should be of the opinion, do your duty to the best of resources that you have. Put all your brains, talents, experience, know-hows, connections, everything into your project. But by the end of the day, when you retire, pray to God and tell, I have performed my duty well to the best of my knowledge. I will accept the results. And you will be an absolutely tensionless, peaceful at mind person with a good sleep without a sleeping pill. <laughs> this is how Pramukh Swami Maharaj worked. When Natubai Patel, the general manager of the Alicor Engineering Company, he asked Pramukh Swami, I've seen you in all the activities of the day. Because to lead such a huge organization, he was the president for 65 years. I've never seen a wrinkle of tension, of depression, of tiredness, of agony ever on your face. How? Pramukh Swami said, in the morning we pray to God and accept all the work of the day that I have to do. Make a list of it. I do it till the end of the day to the best of my knowledge and resources. In the evening, I give it back to God that I did in the best of my capacities. Now whatever results you decide, I will accept it. Tension comes and your goals break and you are not able to give a good thinking to life because this goal I have set up with all my thinking, all my meetings, all my planning, all my executions. Why did it not happen? This is the problem with you all. But accept it. Just ask yourself, did I put all my resources into it? Yes. Then don't worry. Things that you can change, Change it and be happy. Things that you cannot change, accept it, but be happy. This is the thinking of goal of your life. <laughs> things that you can change, well within your control, change it. But things which are not in your control, you can't change it. Then accept it. There are only two things. Either change or either accept. But you are of the mindset, see, I am an MBA from London School of Economics. I am being told by my professors that you can do anything you think. You can carry out any project successfully that you design. Why is this not happening? That professor teaching you at LSE is all theory and now this is practical. You can't learn horse riding in library and go on the horse on the first day without a trainer. But our mindset is such, our mindset is such that when I have all the capabilities it must happen. Am I touching the point exactly in your mind? Our mindset today in the corporate world is when something is in my mind, when I am deciding to do, when I have resources, when I am working hard, it must happen. This is wrong. Absolutely wrong. Go for a big try, but accept at the end of the day to remain stable, to maintain the emotional equilibrium. But then we want to poke our nose everywhere. We, want, we are so intelligent that we have knowledge of all the fields. If Virat Kohli goes out cheaply in five runs, you have a comment on him. The ball was pitched outside the off stump. It was an outswing away from the stumps. Why did Virat Kohli go away from his body to slash it? 
डेफिनेटली इट गेट्स एन आउटर एज ही गेट्स कॉट इन द स्लीप खेलना ही नहीं आता उसको वाह I don't say you are wrong in this comment but you are not at all eligible for this comment because you don't know what is facing 95 miles per hour deliveries hum log sab cricket khel rahe hain bachpan mein we all played cricket but it was gully cricket drawing stumps on somebody's walls with a coal and you are comment about come out or commenting about him you know what is 95 98 miles per hour deliveries and they cut on both the sides 2 feet after pitching virat kohli or anybody any batsman he has 40th part of a second to judge what to do with this you don't have they don't have big times like you to sit in offices for 2 hours of meetings that you decide a project what to do with this आप ये माइंडसेट में हो हाँ दो घंटा चर्चा कर ली अब तो सब कुछ तैयार हो गया अब तो होना ही चाहिए ही डजेंट हैव दैट ही डजेंट हैव एवरीथिंग ऑन पेपर एवरी डिलीवरी इज अ न्यू वन ही हेज फोर्टी पार्ट ऑफ अ सेकंड टू जज व्हाट टू डू विद दिस डिलीवरी एंड अ स्मॉल मिस्टेक एंड इज गॉन एंड द होल कंट्री इज अप एंड वी सिटिंग ईयर वी डोंट हैव एन एक्सपीरियंस slightest experience not even an ounce of experience of what is emotional pressure to perform when 50000 people are staring at you none of us have this experience and millions watching you live on tv virat kohli has to forget millions of his fans millions of live watchers millions of tv watchers his companies that and products that is endorsing nothing the line and length of the delivery When I talk to students, I tell them the amount of energy that Virat Kohli uses in one day, if he plays the whole day, in his concentration, is the amount of energy that a 12th standard student uses in last three months of his preparation of exam. Tremendous energy and concentration, and you start commenting about him. Rethinking of your goals, remain restricted to yourself. Go deep in your field. have superficial information about about things so that you may be in the society go deep in your field and enjoy your life you are all here and me too are least concerned why trump went won over hillary in philadelphia in florida in california we must only know that he won against hillary and is now the president of us philadelphia philadelphia mein ye issue tha florida mein ye the why are you concerned sitting here in indore you open up page 3 in the morning you are a fool why are you opening it why you do you want to go deep into people's lives i tell you you people sitting here know more about hollywood bollywood stars than your children if i ask you five names of your children's friends 90% of you will not know and if i ask you give me five names of bollywood hollywood and indian cricket team you will give me 10 you don't know the goals of your life you and your family are top priority and i'll give you in one sentence all the stories of page 3 right from the day it started to the day it will go shall i tell you so you don't have to open page 3 every day in the morning every morning two people come together and every evening two people who had come together yesterday they parted This is page three story. Every morning, two people come together, an actor and an actress. And every evening, those two who came together yesterday, they parted. These are stories of page three. Why are you putting the yourself into that gossip? And then you pick up the phone and tell your friend, "Pata chala, pata chala, tere ko usko ye ho gaya." You are a fool. You discuss people. You are a cheap mind. you discuss events you are an average mind and you discuss ideas you are a great mind now check your category now check your category which type of mind you are by the type of the discussions and the activity that you do faith in god is stabilizing yourself by your thought processes 
faith in God. Now experimentally it is proved. You recently by the University of Pennsylvania, University of Philadelphia, I can give you the names, Dr. Andrew Newberg, Dr. Ed G. Cohen, they did a wonderful survey. 4,000 people called from all over the United States across caste, creed, religion, nationality backgrounds. They were made to sit in Indian postures and do 12 minutes of chanting the holy name of God in whichever form of God that they believed in. Before that, their MRIs and mind mappings were done by special psycho neuro softwares. After the experiments for eight weeks, again their mind mapping and MRIs were done by psycho neuro softwares version 2.0. And the secretion of hormones in their body when they have certain thought processes, when they have certain emotions was checked. And you know the final outcome. You can read this on the website of University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And with them there was an NGO called the Child Trends. Their CEO is Philip Fletcher. I'm giving you the names. You can read it. They found out it was an absolute scientific experiment that 12 minutes of chanting the holy name of God in the first age group from 4 to 12 age children, they found that they had 23% increase in their memory power. Isn't this good for your growth, for your progress and your success? In the age group of 12 to 22, teenagers and youngsters, 12 minutes of chanting the whole name, holy name, they found at the university, these two scientists by their psycho neuro softwares, that they had 15 to 18% increase in their willpower and confidence. Isn't this a big gain in life? The third age group, 22 to 60, most of us that we are sitting here today, working age group, they had about 15 to 20% increase in their buffer capacity. That is the capacity to absorb shocks of life. Because the shocks come to this age group, 22 to 60, personal life, family life, professional career, everything, professional career, all of them come And the last age group was 60 to 80, that is retired and old age people, chanting the holy name of God that they believed in for 12 minutes a day. The psycho neuro softwares at the University of Philadelphia it proved that this age group had an amazing 20% plus increase in their strength of immune system. So they proved in their report that chanting the holy name of God can give you a better memory power increase your willpower and confidence, better your buffer capacities, increase the strength of your immune system. Isn't this a very big advantage? You people are businessmen. Anything FOC, you like it. This is FOC. Chanting the holy name for 12 minutes, you don't have to give anything. Even when you are bathing, even when you are doing your morning course, you can have it, seriously. But sitting at one person doing is more advantage. But such big advantages, at University of Columbia, they surveyed one lakh families over eight years in 110 countries of the world, in five continents across caste, creed, religion, nationality. And they came to a conclusion that a small religious activity every day, like chanting the name of prayers and everything, it gives you better health. It increases the academics of your children. And more importantly, they finally said, that it has the capacity to increase your tolerance level and increase your acceptance level for a better family life. Your advantages. So, rethinking your goals, principally in one line of all that I talked today, is don't just go for your materialistic pursuits, your wealth, your status, your fame. At the same time, try to be a great human being where you have all the good values and virtues. You distinguish yourself from an ordinary animal life. You remain satisfied with your life. And at the age of 80 or 90, you can put your hand on your chest and tell yourself, yes, I lived my life. If you can do this, it is well lived. So finally, understand the difference between fun Joy, happiness, and bliss. We all take fun as ultimate happiness. I just exemplify by one line, then I will end my talk. You want to drive a car at 100 miles per hour, and you got to drive, and what you experience is fun. You wanted that car in your possession, to own that car, and you got it. 
that is called joy. You can keep that car lifelong is your happiness. And if you lose that car by an accident or to a theft, or you have to compulsorily sell it to meet other financiers, you don't feel the sense of it going away from your life because you tell yourself, when I was born, I was not born with this car and when I will die, I will not ca carry this car along with me. So it was somewhere in the middle that I got it, somewhere in the middle, I lost it. And you can remain stable, that is your bliss. <laughs> Reaching that level of bliss is the human goal. So don't enroll yourself with just fun and joy activities. Go a step further to happiness and bliss activities. That is rethinking your goal. My all prayers for all of you. Thank you for patiently listening to me. And I definitely pray at the feet of my Guru Pramukh Swami Maharaj and present Guru Mahan Swami Maharaj to bless us all with this wonderful thinking. May we all better our own lives. May we all sitting here become one small factor in developing and reaching the lives of people around you, thus enriching the environment. And we just not want to leave a better world for our next generation. We want to leave a much, much better enriched environment for our next generation. My all prayers for all of you. Thank you very much.